Welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. The topic for this month's show is hands-on astronomy activities for kids. There are six projects that we'll be featuring during this segment. These types of projects are really great ways to engage kids. Uh, many children learn by touching rather than seeing or reading, so this helps them out a lot. Also, they get uh, the sense of pride in creating something and also accomplishment as well. Now, again, it depends on the age of the kids involved, uh, how much adult supervision is involved. Obviously, the older the child, the less you have to do for them or manage for them. But the important thing is don't do it for them. Let them learn by doing. Okay? If they mess one up, make another one. It's okay. Uh, you wouldn't teach them to ride a bike by having them stand on the sidewalk and watch you ride by, now would you? Our first project is a planisphere. It comes as two parts. They'll print us two sheets. When you print it off, you can see the website down there at the bottom of your screen. And uh, for these, we'll uh, also have the, all of the web addresses at, on the scroll at the end of the show. Now, when you cut these out, I've already done that to spare you the boredom of watching me cut stuff out. Uh, you'll cut out the circle, and then you'll also cut out the holder. Now, when you do, be sure you include this white part down here. That's outlined with a black line. That forms the pocket that helps hold the star wheel. Now, a way to make these a bit more serviceable, I've only got them on copy paper, would be to adhere them to a stiffer surface, such as an old manila folder, or maybe even a cereal box. You could repurpose one of those, but glue it to the inside. It won't stick to the glossy outer surfaces. Uh, you can use a glue stick. It's a great way. Uh, kids can use this, and non-toxic, and uh, they can have a good time with it. Apply it to the paper, and then bond that to the stiffer surface, such as the manila folder or the cereal box. Now, if you have access to uh, cardstock, you could print these right onto cardstock if your uh, printer will handle it. The way to make the uh, pocket on this is to take a straight edge a ruler, lay it down along the edge between the white and the darker surface, fold it over. There are two staple marks, so you'll Fold this back up and staple it at the appropriate spots. Once you've got it complete, it will look like this. Now, to use, what you would do is take the month that you want to observe, okay, in this case, we're in December, and then the time that you'd want to observe. In this case, I've set it for December 15th at 9 p.m. Now you'll notice there are two sets of times on this. One is daylight saving, the other is standard. Because we're now in December, we're once again on standard time. So turn the wheel to the date and time you want to observe. The line that you see around here is your horizon. So whichever direction you want to look, make sure that is down. In this case, south is here, north is up top, east and west are on the opposite sides. So decide which way you want to look, hold it up with the date and the time, and what you see on the planisphere is what you will see in your night sky. We'll assume, of course, that the night is clear. Now, you're outside, you're going to observe. Our next project can be quite handy. You know when you want to observe, but you also want to know, well, what time is it? What would I see at a given time? Now, you forgot your watch. Darn. So, hey, no problem. I'll just use my smartphone to check the time. Problem is, you didn't recharge it. It's dead. So, how do you know what time it is? Well, you can use our second project, which is our star clock. The star clock is two components, just like we had for the planisphere, but these print on one eight and a half by 11 sheet of copy paper. Again, you can use the manila folder or the cereal box or print it out on cardstock if you prefer. Cut these items out, especially you can see right here with the notch. Now, 
to assemble the two parts together, in the center, make a little X on both of the pieces, both the darker part and the time circle. Through that, you'll take one of these paper binders. Don't know if that's showing up very well or not. I'll try to hold it up like this. You can find these in any office supply. You may have one in your junk drawer in the kitchen. Take the paper holder, slide it through the two little slits that are marked in the center circles, and spread them out. Now, to use this handy dandy device, put the month that you're observing at the top. Again, that would be December. Then, what you need to do is find the Big Dipper, okay, the seven brightest stars in the constellation of the Big Bear, Ursa Major. Turn the inner wheel until the position of the Big Dipper on the inner wheel matches your view of the Dipper in the sky. Now, you may wonder, how can I tell which way is north? Well, try to remember where the sun set for that day, and if you face that direction, north is to your right. Once you have the position of the Dipper as you see it in the sky with your month on top, the pointer will point to that time. So this way you're able to tell time by the stars. So again, keep your current month at the top, December, get the view of the Big Dipper that's in the sky on the inner dial, and it will point to the time. Now this is standard time. Again, if you're using it during the summer, you need to add an hour for daylight savings time. Our third project involves making an astrolabe. Now this kind of sounds like a strange word. Many folks aren't too familiar with that. But uh, this is uh, very similar to the function of a sextant. And uh, Steve Whitty will be talking about sextants in uh, the term of the month in just a few minutes. This is also a very easy project to make. You print the sheet out. Now this is a little small and this is the way it prints. But you can also make this bigger once you print it. Just put it on the copier and set the copier for as large as you would like to make it and it'll still work just fine. Cut it out from the sheet. An easy way to uh, make the little circles that you see right here is to take a single hole punch and just go along where it's marked and clip those out. These are important because it'll help you in locating the particular degree of latitude that you're going to be looking for. Also, there's a little black dot up here in the corner. Take a small nail and punch that through. Now again, you may want to put this on the uh, piece of uh, stiffer material before you do all this cutting and punching. Once you've got that done, you need to attach the straw. Any drinking straw will do. But what you don't want to do is tape it directly on to the surface of this astrolabe. Tape it slightly above, sort of loop the tape around the straw and attach it so that it rides just above the very top edge of your piece. Through the little hole, pass the string. The string is about, oh, 12 inches in length. You'll put a small knot in the back and then attach an everyday washer to the other end of the string. Now, to use this, tool. Just hold it up like this. Look through the straw at the particular object, a star, let's say, and then once you've done that, hold it steady, grip the string, and look to see what the latitude of that particular object is. Now you could do this over the course of an evening and chart that particular star's pathway across the nighttime sky as it gets higher and higher until it reaches its highest point in the sky and then starts to head down towards the western horizon. A word of note to the, the adults supervising this and to the kids doing it. Never, ever use this to look at the sun. The moon is fine, stars are fine, planets are fine. Never, ever look at the sun with this. Now, 
In just a few minutes, we'll uh, be hearing from Steve Witte on term of the month. He'll be uh, talking to us about sextants. Uh, if you would like more information, you could go to our website. You can see the uh, email address for that down at the bottom of your screen. And uh, coming up next, as I've already promoted for you, is Stephen Witte with Term of the Month. We'll be right back. Thanks, Don. This is Term of the Month for December 2014. And the term is sextant. Now, uh, Don just talked about an astrolabe, and an astrolabe measures angles, and typically an astrolabe has uh, numbers all the way around the circle, so all the way around the circle, and you can measure any angle, uh, any angle, no, no matter how wide, with an astrolabe, in principle. A sextant has one-sixth of the circle, so 360 degrees, one-sixth of that is 60 degrees. And the typical modern sextant uses a couple of mirrors, so on the right there on the, on the screen, there is a telescope, it's horizontal, and it points at a mirror, but you get to see uh, both what is in the mirror and you get to see the tele in the telescope view. On the left there, you can see on the left that you're seeing whatever is the, the telescope would be looking at if there was no mirror. The upper mirror is attached to the thing that measures the angles. So what you do is you move this uh, lower lever, lever, which uh, changes the angle that you're measuring, but it also moves this upper mirror. And what you're supposed to do if, for example, you're trying to find out how high the sun is in the sky, is you move this until the sun is in the horizon on the right half of your view and your horizon is still on the, in the left half of your view. When you're done with that, you uh, sort of clamp down where you are, and then you just read the angle there. And when you do that, you find out exactly how high the sun is in the sky. Uh, the advantage of this approach over uh, the full circle astrolabe is that uh, the astrolabe isn't quite as accurate. If there's no telescope or, uh, or, or something, um, even with a telescope, it's hard to get the angles exactly right. Uh, with the modern sextant, uh, it's really quite easy. Um, so then the question is, well, why does the astrolabe only have 60 degrees? I mean, could you ever want to measure something higher than 60? And the answer is yes, you, you could have the sun straight overhead, especially if you were a navigator at the equator. Uh, but it turns out that if you've got a straight through telescope, it is very, very difficult to look higher than about 70 degrees up. So 60 degrees turns out to be a reasonable compromise for the navigator. Uh, for the astronomer, the astronomer may want to look at angles that are straight up, and the astronomer's telescope uh, usually is the, the better tool for that. Uh, finally, going back to the astrolabe, uh, I looked up the astrolabe in some detail. This is an Iranian astrolabe of, of, uh, from antiquity, and uh, so it has markings all the way around the, the edge, and it has markings inside which give you sort of a feel for what the night sky looks like, kind of a precursor to the modern planisphere. And so that's the term of the month for December 2014. Back to you, Don. Thanks, Steve. Welcome back to the program. For this show, we're talking about hands-on astronomy activities for kids. In the first part of the show, we covered three different activities. Now, we'll talk about three more. Our first one is how to make a sundial. Not quite as uh, difficult as it might seem. We have our components right over here. Again, going to the website that uh, you see down there at the bottom of your screen. You can print this off. It prints as one sheet, 
And as we talked about in the first part of the show, you can adhere these to a more stiffer substrate to make them a little bit more serviceable. Now, once you've actually cut the parts out, just follow the instructions on the sheet. Uh, one important thing is to cut a line. You'll see it marked when you print this out, part way up till a little X. Then just fold along the dotted lines, again using a straight edge or a ruler to keep the lines reasonably straight. These two little tabs down here actually go underneath the plate of the sundial. Just slide it through the slit, turn it over, grab yourself some handy scotch tape right here and tape it to the bottom so it stays in place and you have your sundial. Now to make this work properly, uh, you're going to need to know your directions. They're marked here on the sheet. There's a little north, south, east, and west. And by following the instructions that will print out with it, they'll advise you how to orient or place your sundial so that uh, you can get the maximum benefit out of it. Now, you need to remember, this is not going to show you the time that's on your watch, okay? We're operating on standard time, okay? The time zones set up back in the 1880s. This measures sun time, which is different from the times on our watches. You can look up on the web to find out the correlation between those two times, but you can just use this project in and of itself and don't worry about what time's on your smartphone or your watch. It's a great activity to uh, have the kids engage in, to see the sun move over the course of the day, record its position, and uh, you can bring this out from time to time. Since it's paper and paper products, not recommended to leave it out in bad weather, but on a nice day, even in winter time, bring it out and make your recordings of the position, the shadow, that this part, which is called the gnomon, cast down upon the plate, which is the uh, horizontal part of the sundial. Our next project is a telescope. Now, this is really a very simple telescope. Uh, it's one that uh, I've used in the past for uh, scouting programs. Uh, when I worked at the old Detroit Science Center, was in charge of the scout program, we would use this for the Cub Scouts to help them with their uh, belt loop and pin requirements could also use it as in a basic science class and uh, it's really a, a fun way to introduce kids to the field of optics. The design, well, is really quite simple. If you think, geez, this looks like a couple of rolls from paper towel, yeah, pretty much. But the neat thing about this is one fits inside the other. Okay, so you can get your focus by sliding it in or out until you achieve the focus in the telescope. Now this, this is really easy to assemble. First, we'll take our little red collar right here, take our large lens, and place it down inside. There's a little ledge around this edge that this will catch into and not fall through. Take this part, place it over the larger of the two tubes. That sets in there quite firmly. Now, we want to make the eyepiece. We'll take our foam piece. Then there's a little cardboard ringlet, a little mini tube, if you will. We'll take that, slide it into the foam, and let it sort of flush out on that one side. Then your lens. There's a curved side and a flat side. Take the flat side, put it into the foam, and push it in till it nests against that little cardboard collar that you placed inside previously. Then pick up your telescope again, and in the smaller end, insert the foam piece with your lens in place. Now, all you need to do at this point is just to hold it up and adjust your focus by sliding the tube forward or back. 
Uh, you can use this for astronomy, of course. Uh, you could use it for looking at things in the distance. Uh, the problem is, though, this is an astronomical telescope. So things on land, like looking at a bird, the bird is going to be hanging upside down. So uh, that's a little something to get used to. But it is fun to look at distant objects, uh, a tall tree, a building in the distance, things like that, in addition to using it for astronomy. Now, earlier you saw the, uh, the website. These can be ordered either singly from the website or you can get them in bulk. Uh, the pricing and the way to go about doing all of that are on the website, so I won't go into that for you. But uh, again, a great way to introduce kids to astronomy. For our final activity, we have another telescope. This one may seem a little bit more involved, but uh, it really isn't. This is the Galileo scope. It was introduced back in 2009 during the International Year of Astronomy that commemorated the 400th anniversary of Galileo turning his uh, newly made telescope to the heavens. Now, it comes complete, everything you need. Also some great instructions. As you pull it out, you'll see a number of components. They even include a set of pieces to use as a work holder, a nest if you will, to lay the two halves of the uh, telescope into. Following the instructions, you construct the scope itself by placing one half of the tube assembly into the uh, nesting fixtures. Insert the lenses and other items following, again, the directions. Then you'll take the second half, place it over, and then there's a series of rubber rings that help hold the two halves together. Now this is surprisingly solid construction. In the description that you just heard, you might think, ah, gee, that doesn't sound all that slick. But I tell you, it really is a great product. Uh, I have my Galileo scope set up right over here on my tripod. On the bottom of the scope is a fitting. It's a quarter 20. It's the same type of fitting that you would use to attach your camera to the tripod. So that works out marvelously. And with the tripod, you generally get that little fixture that has the screw already in it. That threads up perfectly into the fitting on here in the telescope. So once you have it on the tripod, again, you can use your alt as back and forth, up and down, to uh, adjust the scope and uh, point it at the object that you're interested in viewing. Now also on here is the warning. Don't look at the sun. Uh, we can never stress this too much. Uh, again, your retinas have no pain sensors. Uh, you won't know you're doing it until you look away and then you can't see anymore. Hopefully you've enjoyed this introduction to hands-on activities for kids. As I mentioned earlier, all of the websites for all of these activities will be in the credits at the end of the show. Uh, if you can't catch it there either, send us uh, an email. Our email is down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, give us your email address and we'll be glad to uh, send those uh, website addresses to you. We hope you've enjoyed uh, this show for uh, December 2014. And coming up next is What's Up in the Night Sky for December with our own Steve Whitty. Thanks for watching. Thanks, Don. 
What's up in the night sky for December 2014? December has the winter solstice, that's the shortest day and the longest night of the year. That is December 21st. Sunrise starts, the month starts at 7.42 a.m. and by the month's end it's 8.02 a.m. So it doesn't really change that much. And sunset goes from 5.02 p.m. to 5, 10 p.m. So again, it doesn't change that much, you know, about 8 to 5. The moons go this way. On December 6th, we have the full moon. On the third quarter is on the 14th. The new moon is on the 21st. That's that winter solstice. So not only do you have the longest night of the year, you also have no moon in the sky to you know, add that extra light pollution. Um, so we've got a great winter solstice this year. And then finally, first quarter is on December 28th. Uh, Mars sets at 8 p.m. So Mars sets only a bit after uh, sunset. Uh, it is best, in my opinion, at about 7 p.m. Jupiter rises um, at 10.30 p.m. It is best before sunrise, but here I have it uh, in the east at about 11 p.m. Uranus and Neptune, well, Uranus sets at 3 a.m. at the beginning of the month and 1 a.m. at the end of the month, and Neptune sets from 11.30 to 9.45 p.m. Uh, but here we are showing it at 8 p.m. And so Mars is just setting in the west, and uh, Neptune and Uranus, which you'll need a really good finder chart for, for both, uh, both of these planets. Um, so they're setting, uh, uh, um, you know, a few hours after Mars. In December, on the evenings of the 12th and the 13th, we have the Geminid meteor shower. Now, uh, the 12th and the 13th are near the third quarter. So basically, the Geminids are good until the moon rises, which is around 11.30 p.m. on these nights. Uh, the moon then sort of washes out the, the uh, uh, all but the brighter uh, meteors. So normally, meteor showers are great after midnight. Um, for this shower, um, you'll really want to uh, uh, go early instead of later. Now, the Geminids can give you five, 50 to 100 per hour, depending on the, you know, how, how things pan out. And so that you can think of that as one per minute. They can be a great, uh, a great shower. Now, this is December, so dress warm. But you'd dress warm anyway for meteor showers because you're not really doing very, anything very active and the, uh, uh, the night sky can be cold even in the summer. Dark skies are better, so get away from the city if you can, and then uh, look at as much of the sky as you can. Uh, I like to just lie down and look straight up. And uh, that's what's up for December 2014. Happy holidays, everyone. We've got the best free show above our heads every single night. Mm -hmm.